Welcome, welcome. We will let folks make their way in from the waiting room and get started in just a moment. Welcome, everyone. Whether you are joining us live for today's Lunch and Learn, Tribal Self-Determination and Efforts at the State and Federal Levels, or whether you're watching the recording on YouTube, we are glad you're here and we are grateful for your partnership in this important work. The Wabanaki, the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians, Mi'kmaq Nation, Passamaquoddy Tribe, and Penobscot Nation, are the original people of the place we call Maine. Now, while self-determination through tribal self-government has led to remarkable economic growth across many tribal nations situated in Indian country, this has not been true for the Wabanaki nations. Unique to Maine, the Federal Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act of 1980 empowers the state government to block the applicability of federal Indian policy in Maine and prevents the Wabanaki nations from being able to regulate matters, including natural resources and land use. Recognizing the myriad impacts and strain that these structural inequities have placed on tribal communities, leaders at the state and federal levels are taking steps to recognize the inherent rights and sovereign powers of the Wabanaki nations. Their work both reflects and inspires the broad and growing movement for tribal sovereignty and self-determination. And we are honored to welcome some of them today. Ambassador Molly and Bryant is the tribal ambassador for Penobscot Nation and among other things, board president for the Wabanaki Alliance, which works to educate the people of Maine about the need for securing sovereignty for the tribes of Maine. And no, I didn't misspeak just now. The ambassador got married last weekend. So congratulations. It is a thrill to get to introduce you as Ambassador Bryant. Congressman Jared Golden represents Maine's second congressional district and last year introduced federal legislation to give Wabanaki tribes the same access to future beneficial federal law as nearly every other federally recognized tribe in America. Thank you for joining us today, Congressman. Speaker Rachel Talbot Ross is the legislative sponsor of LD 2007, an act to advance self-determination for Wabanaki nations. The speaker had intended to join us today, but the end of session legislative schedule just didn't cooperate. And we know she is doing important work in the State House today and uh, miss her and understand. My name is Kathleen Meal. I am the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. Since 2020, this weekly online Lunch and Learn series has helped us advance all of these goals, creating a shared space to explore Maine's environmental and social history, policy priorities, climate action movement, and more. The movement for tribal self-determination has been the focus of many Lunch and Learns, and you can find all of them in the Equity and Racial Justice playlist on Maine Conservation Voters YouTube page. It is probably pretty obvious, but to be crystal clear, 
our organizations support recognition of the inherent sovereignty and self-determination of the Wabanaki nations. This support is guided by our commitment to equity and our understanding of the role that environmental organizations have and can play in advancing social justice and civil rights. We believe that recognizing the inherent sovereignty of the tribes in Maine is a civil rights issue and that there is no better way to protect tribal lands and waters than to recognize tribal self-determination. A few technical notes for today. Ambassador Bryant and Congressman Golden will share some opening remarks and then we'll use the bulk of our time together for your questions. These incredible leaders are involved in an array of important and urgent work Today's focus is on tribal self-determination. You can send your questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you. I will compile them, synthesize those with similar themes, and ask as many of them as possible. We ask that you not message speakers directly as we want their focus on the program and not the chat box. If you have any technical difficulties today, you can message Will Sedlak and he will help you out. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thank you again for joining us and let's get into it. Ambassador Bryant, let's start with you. Welcome. As Penobscot Nation Tribal Ambassador, you work to represent Penobscot Nation and advocate for policy changes at the local, state, and federal levels of government. That includes, but is definitely not limited to, self-determination. You also co-chair the state's permanent commission on the status of racial, ind indigenous, and main tribal populations and co-chair the Maine Climate Council's Equity Subcommittee. Other than making you an extremely busy woman, how does all of that work intersect? Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, great to see you, and, and thanks for having me today, and, and thanks to Congressman Golden for joining us. And uh, I do have a baby on my lap. I <laughs> did not grow another head, <laughs> so um, if she wakes up, I'll be handing her off, but she's here. Um, so great question. And, and I'm really lucky to kind of have my attention on so many things and, and that can get kind of overwhelming, but it also informs my work across all of those things, I think. So I've been involved in tribal policy for quite some time. Uh, I'm uh, in my third appointment as ambassador, and, and I've been doing this work uh, since 2017. Prior to that, I was elected to tribal council, and, and I've kind of always been engaged on these issues since I was a teenager. So I've seen kind of firsthand how the systems in Maine really perpetuate themselves to um, work for the ones it works for and and really um, hold down the folks that it doesn't. And that's usually not the fault of anyone in any of these schemes. It's just kind of how things are uh, based on history and uh, you know policy and, and where we are now. So I don't think our job is to point blame or, or sit around and complain about it. I think our job is to make it better. And I'm really um, thankful to have so many kind of bites at that apple. So with a permanent commission, I'm able to learn about the, the plights and the stories and journeys of so many different marginalized communities in Maine. And, and we come together around policy and community engagement and legislation. And, um, you know, we're able to advise all three branches of government and take on special projects. And the real power in that work is hearing from the different constituencies that I don't often hear from, uh, as well as my tribal, you know, colleagues that, that serve on that commission. And, and it really does inform the, the policy aspect of things because we talk about how the Settlement Act has really stifled self-determination, has blocked us from our federal rights. And part of that piece that we've kind of always known, but that we've proven with the Harvard report that we commissioned is that 
rural Maine has also suffered because the tribes have suffered under the Settlement Act. So when I think about in both the equity subcommittee work that looks at frontline communities, low-income communities, uh, when, we, when we talk about climate change and the permanent commission, there's a through line of if the tribes were able to fully have our sovereignty recognized, fully experience uh, the self-determination that we're entitled to, it would bring so many other folks along. And I can say that really confidently uh, after doing the work with those two other bodies so much. So I think that there's some real variances in the different work, um, but there's some real things that that keep it all tied together for me to it. And that certainly makes it easier to be pulled in so many directions. That is so, so helpful. And and I know you said you've been active in this work since you were a teenager. And, and I've heard you talk about learning to speak that truth early on and, and to help to end the harmful stereotyping that goes along with with Native Americans as mascots. And you also played a really important role in, in Maine's replacing Columbus Day with a, a holiday that honors the indigenous community's presence thousands of years before European contact. Um, you made a difference. Maine banned Native American mascots and adopted Indigenous Peoples Day in, in 2019. Can you connect the dots between those advocacy advocacy campaigns and the movement for tribal sovereignty and self-determination that we're we're in the midst of now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I would love to <laughs> because I get a little prickly when people say, well, those are just symbolic things. This is what really matters. Um, because it all matters. And maybe on varying degrees at different points, and maybe getting rid of mascots doesn't put more financial resources into, into communities or put more food on tables, but it certainly gets us to an equal playing field. You will not engage with folks and make good policy for them if you don't see them as human beings. Um, you will not work with someone as equals if you're glorifying a holiday um, that basically celebrates the genocide of their ancestors. These things are connected, whether we realize it or not. And being involved in the 129th legislature, you know, passing those two bills with Representative Collings, um, that really set the table for so many great discussions about tribal rights and, and self-determination. And I, I count uh, or I uh, credit a lot of the momentum we have to a lot of the relationships we formed back then, and even well before then, when it was a grassroots approach, um, you know, working on both of those issues and really, you know, getting to the heart of that, that activism that, that drove many of us. So I think that, you know, I don't like to see them as separate issues. I, I like to see, you know, we are entitled to be treated as human beings. We are entitled to have uh, our self-determination as federally recognized tribes. I, I see them as very much connected. And I do think that we paved the way for a lot of this Settlement Act legislation with the you know, discussions we started uh, in the 129th with those bills. And that's that's the way it's done, right? You build, build, and build, and build. And let's, um, we're gonna have a lot more questions for you, Ambassador, but Speaking of building, let's go all the way up to the federal level and uh, and bring Congressman Golden into the conversation. Congressman Jared Golden, you are in your third term in Congress where you serve on the Small Business and Armed Services Committees. Before that, you served in Maine's House of Representatives, including as Assistant Majority Leader. We are so grateful for you joining us today and uh, wonder, how, how did you come to introduce H.R. 6707, Advancing Equality for the Wabanaki Nations Act, along with, with your co-sponsor, Representative Shelley Pingree? Tell us a little bit about it. Thank you, Kathleen. And it's great to be here with Ambassador uh, Bryant now. Uh, congratulations. Uh, I'm sure you had a great weekend. Um, so... You know, it, it really, it does for me start with, with my time in the legislature. Uh, I was serving um, at a historic time, really, for relationships between uh, the state 
the state legislature and the tribes. Uh, some of you may remember um, that the tribal representatives chose to walk out of the legislature at that time because of uh, the very poor uh, relationship uh, between the tribes and the state. Um, and uh, really, I think they did that to raise attention uh, and, and try and make sure that they were um, elevating uh, their their voices and, and their message. And, and that's the first time that uh, I really uh, became aware of, of um, you know, the way things are uh, and, and started to pay attention. Uh, and so um, that was a big moment. Back in 2018, when I ran for this house in, uh, representing Maine second congressional district, I met a young man, uh, Corey Hinton. Uh, and we started talking about uh, issues having to do with uh, the tribes in Maine second district. And I really formed a good relationship with Corey. Um, and, and through uh, my work around the district, I, I got to know Chief Francis quite well uh, and made commitments uh, once I was in office to, to go and, and visit uh, the the tribes in, in the different reservations. And, uh, you know, I, I did that with uh, Molly and I did that with, with uh, Chief Francis, uh, later went to um, see, uh, you know, the, the Passamaquoddy and, and have really tried uh, my best to, to get around and meet uh, with, with all of them because at the end of the day, they're my constituents the same as anyone else. Uh, but I, I wanted to learn more uh, about their lives, about their communities, uh, you know, what was happening and, and what might I be able to do at the federal level to be helpful. Uh, you know, I was really in a learning phase early on. So uh, I, I guess I would describe 2019 in that way, uh, going and, and meeting with tribal leaders, uh, seeing, uh, you know, um, seeing the reservations uh, in just all ears. Um, 2020, of course, a strange time for all of us. Uh, with with COVID-19, uh, bringing much of our connections uh, to a stop, at least in a you know in-person way. And in in 2021, I actually just came personally to a position of supporting sovereignty for the tribes. Uh, I, I I arrived there pretty, I think, naturally through my relationships and conversations, and and through that learning process that I just described to you. Uh, early on in my time uh, as the representative for Maine too. And so I put an op-ed out in, I think it was the Bangor Daily News sometime in early 2021, um, stating my position there. And I, I thought that was important. I think it's the first time a member of the federal delegation ha has uh, done that um, in my lifetime anyways, uh, held uh, that position um, you know, so clearly. And uh, I wanted to use the, the position I have to really try and push forward on that. Uh, after that, I, I sat down with the uh, different um, tribe, tribal leaders uh, and others, including folks uh, like Corey Hinton and, and uh, Ambassador Bryant, and we had a conversation about what we could try and do. Uh, and, and we really started from a place of talking about legislation to um, go for sovereignty outright, uh, to consider uh, going uh, right at the main land claim settlement act uh, and redoing that outright. Um, I think that that's where everyone was and starts from and remains today. However, we're trying to we were trying to think pragmatically about what what might we be able to accomplish since it, it did not seem likely that we would be successful in passing uh, that. Uh, so we started talking about federal laws. Uh, and could we just change that portion of the Maine Land Claim Settlement Act, the Maine Implementa Implementa Implementation Act, MIA? Um, and we started to look at that through conversations with some members of, of the Maine delegation and, and other leaders in, in Maine politics who uh, have not agreed with us on, on, um, on sovereignty or on access to federal laws. We finally settled down to a place of saying like, well, how about we just change it so that looking forward into the future, if Congress passes a law to benefit Indian peoples anywhere in America, that our tribes in Maine will automatically be recognized the same and have access to them, no different than anyone else. And we really viewed that as the floor 
uh, of what we would pursue together. Um, and, and it really represented a compromise, but it, uh, had we been successful, we would not have stopped there. Uh, I think we saw value in having the debate in Congress for the first time. We had hearings about this, but we also felt like just changing the dynamic looking forward into the future uh, would, would have value, but it, but it wouldn't have been enough. So uh, I, I guess that's, I'll stop there, Kathleen. It gives you a little bit of a, a flavor for how we got there. Um, I'm happy to talk later about how far we got with that legislation. Of course, it didn't become law. It, uh, LD 2004 reflects a step up. Instead of just looking ahead, it would have been retroactive. It would be retroactive. Um, and, and like I said, I, I, at the end of the day, I, I, I think uh, sovereignty is the goal. Thank you so much, Congressman. I really appreciate that that sort of story of how you both learned, became aware of, and then the, the way you deepened your learning and understanding and, and really the partnership uh, that has led to these, these efforts. And, you know, one of the things that I think has been a challenge for, for lots of us is figuring out how the, the federal piece and the state piece interact. And can you just say a little bit more about that of a is it, we're talking about making changes at the state level that would influence how federal law is, is applied or making changes at the federal level that would influence how state law plays out. That's confusing. <laughs> Does it make sense to you? Explain it. Sure, and I'm going to rely on Ambassador Bryant to help me a little bit, but it is complex and it's confusing. And, and that's a part of why, like when I said, I spent a lot of time trying to learn about all of this. I really mean that. Um, and it's still complex. The legislative process itself is always very complex. And, and that makes, um, you know, for a high barrier when you're trying to do big things, um, you know, it's, it's, it can be a high barrier when you're trying to do small things. So that's uh, definitely something that we're up against. My understanding uh, of the history of this process is that the Mainland Claim Settlement Act, uh, of course, um, is the federal law. The MIA, um, the Main Implementation Act, is that correct? Uh, yes, um, is, is the state statute. These two things together codify the agreement that was reached. And so there's a lot of debate out there taking place in Congress with uh, the hearing and um, consideration of my legislation, but also in the legislature with the many hearings and bills that have been brought forward before the legislature in recent years, there's a lot of debate. You'll hear testimony about whether or not one can act without the other. You know, can Congress act without the main legislature or vice versa? And there's deferring opinions. And, and I suspect that we could probably find some constitutional law, you know, scholars and, and others out there, lawyers and lawmakers, um, policymakers who could in good faith disagree about who is right. Um, I think the easiest uh, way to consider this is that Congress and the legislature could work together to come to an agreement with uh, with our tribes about a pathway forward if reform and change is what we're looking for and, and can agree to. Does that sound right, Molly? I mean, it, honestly, if, if there's if there's better detail or if you can describe it better than I can, please do. No, you did a great job. And I think one kind of example we can give as to how these things interact is the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization. So the uh, provision in the Settlement Act that blocks us essentially from having access to these federal laws. There is language that says if we can be specifically added in this law, um, then it can apply. So there's a long kind of complicated history with VAWA. Um, we were under the impression when it passed that it did apply to us. The state of Maine stepped in sometime later um, when Penobscot was chosen to be part of a pilot program actually. Um, and the state of Maine stepped in and said, no, we think this uh, preempts or affects our jurisdiction, so it won't apply. So eventually we worked down a couple avenues, one being a piece of legislation at the state level with uh, Speaker Talbot Ross sponsoring that, and another later in uh, the federal bill where we were specifically named, um, our delegation all supported that, as a congressman knows. Uh, so that 
worked. <laughs> it's a long and cumbersome process. It's the only law we've been able to do that for. Um, but that sort of shows how, you know, those different relationships are, are all kind of working at once. And, and I think it's important to note that there are hundreds of laws that have been passed, uh, over 100 that have been passed by Congress through the years uh, that other tribes in America have full access to, and it's not contested uh, in any way. Um, and that is in, um, I don't know, I think over 30 different states where, uh, you know, those tribes uh, are have full access to those laws. Maine is um, unique here and not in a, in a good way. So over 500 tribes with access to uh, over 100 federal laws to benefit uh, those those tribes and, and ours. Uh, have to be specifically written into the law by name in order to have access to that federal law, unlike all the others who um, the law is silent about them specifically, but it is written for them and, and passed into law for them. Thank you both for, for starting to peel those pieces apart because it is, you know, we, we hear a lot, the federal laws do apply, the federal laws don't apply. It's a they only apply when we're very, very explicit about that process, either upfront or, or after the fact. Um, and Congressman Golden, I am just so curious. We talk about the, the, the discussions about sovereignty and self-determination at the state level. There's a lot of, well, what if, what if, what if? But as you said, this is not a scenario that exists anywhere else for any other tribes. So what do your colleagues in Congress think about this situation? And when you did introduce HR 6707, what did people say to you? I'm, I'm so curious about how the rest of the, the country looks at us. Well, um, you know, I, I... It's, there's 435 people in the House of Representatives, and I can guarantee you that they're not all paying attention to, to Maine, um, and it's their job to represent their people um, and, and mine to represent uh, ours. So um, there have been some who have gotten very in, in involved um, and have been very supportive. Uh, I'll, I'll name just a few um, of my colleagues who really helped me in passing my legislation through the House of Representatives. Um, a, a new addition to the Congress uh, and someone who's in the Blue Dog Coalition with me, uh, Mary Paltola. Uh, she is from Alaska. Sharice uh, Davids, I don't know if you know her. She won in 2018, the same class I came into. We're both on the Small Business Committee together, uh, and she chairs the, the Native American Caucus. Uh, last Congress and this Congress, she was uh, a real um, moving force in helping me to advance this legislation. Uh, Deb Holland, uh, Secretary uh, of Interior, uh, also a Native American woman, uh, one of uh, the first two to serve in the Congress and both in the same class alongside me. Uh, I mentioned, mentioned Sharice earlier. Deb and I sat side by side on the Armed Services Committee for two years uh, and became very close. Uh, and there's um, no doubt that she brought a lot of focus and energy uh, into this debate in the last Congress and was very helpful. Uh, Chairman Grijalva, uh, that this is the relevant committee where my legislation sat, has long been a champion uh, of these types of issues for uh, tribes around the country. Um, and Senator Ben Ray Lujan, uh, kind of late in the game, started to get involved. Uh, and should we make another run at it in Congress, I think uh, would be a, as well. It, as, it, as it relates to our bill, Kathleen, uh, there were those who were just supportive of it for, I think, obvious reasons, which I'll, I'll, I'll revisit in a minute. Most of the opposition simply grew out of uh, the fact that um, members of the committee uh, staff and uh, members, mostly Republican members, reached out to uh, the main um, state governor's office uh, and asked for their feedback, and, and they opposed, and, and therefore they latched on to that and basically said, we don't think Congress should be acting without the support of the state of Maine. Uh, my counter argument was one uh, position, um, even a governor 
does not speak in full for the entire state. And, and in fact, we see in, in our representative body uh, in the main legislature so much support for this. Uh, one could argue that that is as reflective or more uh, of the position of the of the state. Um, so th that kind of gives you the breakdown of the debate. We successfully passed this through the House of Representatives, not once, but twice, attached it to uh, an omnibus spending package at the end of last Congress. Unfortunately, we did not have the support um, to keep it in there in, in the Senate, uh, which is why it was stripped out and, and then uh, Know, failed to, to move on. And, and that's the current state of play. We decided, I think, as a group to sit back and um, try this from the state level in, in the form of um, LD 2004. Thank you. And I think that's a, a great point to or place to, to open it up to, to both of you and to remind folks you can feel free to send questions to me through the chat uh, for, for either or both speakers. Uh, and a, a question for both of you. It sounds like you're in really close coordination with, you know, what do we do at the federal level? What do we do at the state level? Uh, I think many of us probably rec recognize names and faces on this program today from, from a really active and strong coalition working with Wabanaki Alliance. What makes this the moment? What makes this the moment for Maine to, to finally recognize the inherent rights and sovereignty of the, the Wabanaki nations? And, and what are the statuses of the, the bills that we see in the Maine legislature this year uh, to, to make that right? Sure, I can get us started. Um, so I, I think this is the moment because we've always known how we've struggled, how we've tried to, to make things right. And, um, you know, in our communities, we have a good grasp of these things uh, and have had little to no faith ever in our relationship with the state government to, to really get things done for us. Um, I think that we've chipped away at some of those barriers uh, at the state level and the federal level for sure. Um, and we've also been able to, you know, involve others in not just our journey and our story, but in our potential outcomes. I think we've made a very solid case that, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And when the tribes are, are doing better, we're going to bring a lot of Maine with us um, and it will benefit everyone. And, and I think we've done a good job of you know, starting the Wabanaki Alliance and expanding our coalition. I, I see a lot of uh, friendly faces here today for sure. And I, I always keep in mind that we are such a small part of the population that nobody really needs to care about us, right? Like we're not powerful in numbers or resources, um, but it really speaks to, you know, that shared humanity that people do care. Um, and that's uplifting. And I think that in today's political and social climate, we're all looking for chances to feel that common humanity with somebody uh, and to advance, you know, interests that, that really might not belong to us, but help all of us. Um, so with the touchy-feely stuff aside, <laughs> the, the legislative update, is so we have LD 2004, which has been explained here a, a little bit. It's very much like HR 6707, um, but it's broader. So that was voted out of committee, the Judiciary Committee yesterday um, with a 10-4 report. Here's Iris waking up. And um, so, so that was bipartisan. We did get the support of Representative John Andrews, a Republican who al also offered an amendment on that bill. So we're, we're feeling, you know, encouraged by that, I, I think that the the governor's continued opposition to it, um, you know, leads people to think, combined with the only one Republican on the committee supporting it, that that we may not have a good veto override chance. But I think right now we're taking it day by day, uh, can focused on on growing support with everybody and, and having conversations with everybody. And I think, as a lot of us know things in Augusta can change minute to minute. So, um, you know, we're, we're feeling hopeful about 2004. And 2007, 
is the larger self-determination bill uh, that was carried over. So we're going to be using this time in between to, to really craft a bill that is based on the task force recommendations, uh, based on 1626 of last session, that, um, that we feel <laughs> uh, is supported by a broad you know, coalition within the legislature, within both chambers. Um, so we'll be working hard on that. We have a few other efforts going forward, um, a bill to kind of bring the Mi'kmaq Nation into parity with, with other legislation um, that the other tribes are included in because they're not included in the Settlement Act. And uh, also in US Supreme Court, great news, the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act was upheld yesterday in a seven to two decision. And there is a main um, bill in the works, LD 1970, that has broad support from the governor's office, AG's office, that also got through the Judiciary Committee and, and should have a clear path into law. And I believe the last one, I'm probably forgetting things, um, but the last one I'll mention for now is LD 78, which is printing uh, the full main constitution. And that's also, um, I believe all the bills I've talked about are sponsored by Speaker Talbot Roth. Um, so this bill is going to be a constitutional um, amendment. And what happened was it was a long time ago, um, you know, basically prohibited, sorry, they were prohibited from printing the entire constitution with the treaty obligations to tribes. So we started off this bill, you know, looking at that piece, and then it was expanded to, well, let's just print the entire main constitution, including that piece. So the good news, you know, as of this morning that uh, has been passed, it's it was under the hammer uh, unanimously in the House and the Senate yesterday, and this morning it reached the two thirds threshold in the House. Um, I don't have word on the Senate yet. So that will be able to be on the referendum uh, as a question in November. And, and that should also you know, keep a lot of good discussions going throughout the, the off season here. Yeah, Kathleen, I, I gotta um, say like, why, why is this the, the moment? Um, and I don't know that it is the moment in, in 2023 or 2024. I hope it is, um, but I, I have come to believe that it's going to happen in in um, it's going to happen in in my life or or you know in, in Molly and um, I guess I would I would use us as examples. I I really am very confident about that. I believe that very strongly. Hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, a lot of times I've heard people who don't agree with tribal self determination. Or even these smaller efforts to just say, well, let's let's give them equal access to all these federal beneficial laws. What people say is, well, the deal is a deal, and this is the deal that was made back in 1978 and, and 1980. And, and so, why why did I focus on Ambassador Bryan and, and myself and saying like it's going to happen in our lifetimes? Well, you know, I I wasn't alive in in 1980, um, so. For those of us, uh, you know, from our generation and younger, there's no uh, connection to, um, you know, the, the strings that tie to, to that deal and, and the process and, and how they landed there um, and everything that came before it. Uh, we've got a, a kind of clean slate to, to work with here. Um, what we do have is, is the evidence that's right in front of right in front of us. Um, and so what I would say is the evidence that I see is that it's not working very well at all for the state, uh, and it's not working for the tribes. And so why wouldn't we try something new? Uh, if, it, if, if the deal has led to uh, a, a situation here that's bad for the tribes, it's not helping the state, and I would even argue is bad for the state, then don't keep doing it, right? You try something new. Uh, and, and why won't people try something new or, or, or what stands in the way? A lot of times, honestly, it's fear-based. Uh, people are scared of change, and there are vested interests that want to keep the status quo for a number of different reasons, and, and they will use that fear and seed that fear and, and try and grow it. Um, I have heard people say that if the tribes had their sovereignty and, and the right to govern themselves, that they might um, 
be like extreme environmentalists who will allow for no economic development uh, of, let's say, like use of the forest for a forest economy uh, or, you know, work concern about what they might do with our rivers or fisheries, etc. cetera. Uh, I've heard some of the same people argue in front of different crowds, the reverse, like maybe in front of a crowd uh, such as the one that I'm in front of today. We can't trust the tribes to have, uh, you know, sovereignty and self-determination. Who would stop them from mining and polluting uh, on those lands? Who would stop them from full-blown uh, deforestation for profit? Uh, they, they, there would be no, you know, state laws that could uh, protect uh, them from polluting the rivers. I mean, they will counter their own arguments depending uh, on the crowd that they are in front of. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of others that I will hear, right? What if I'm hunting in the woods and, and I accidentally cross into tribal lands while hunting and I um, get arrested? What will happen? Well, you know, I I don't think that there's much to fear there. I, I suspect that uh, they any hunter would be treated just like any other hunter anywhere else in, in Maine according uh, to Maine laws. But um, here's where I've landed. It First of all, it's the right thing to do. It's as simple as that. Um, in addition, there's, other, there's plenty of examples around the country uh, of states living with and you know, side by side, um, you know, coordinating with tribes uh, who are sovereign and have their own lands. And there's many different examples you can look at. Um, and yeah, sometimes you can find some complexities and difficulties no different than towns having to live side by side or municipalities having to deal with state uh, bureaucrats in federal laws, et cetera, et cetera. That's, this is just what it takes to live together, uh, working through those types of complexities. So um, there's not really much to fear there, but there are some great examples out there uh, uh, where states and tribes are mutually you know, beneficial in complementing one another's efforts to build up their uh, economies and to live better quality lives um, and, and, and just make their communities better. And it's seamless in some instances. So we know that it can work uh, if we just give it uh, a, a try. So you know, bottom line is that I, as I've gotten to know uh, the leaders of the tribes and gone and, and visited them, like they want all the same things we want. Uh, they want you know good schools. They want healthy communities. They they want clean water and clean air, just like we do. Uh, they also want economic opportunity uh, for themselves and for their kids and for the future. They happen to live in my part of the state, uh, where often that's some of our traditional things, right? That people do to make that kind of a living. Uh, they're involved in the forest products industry. Uh, they fish, they are, you know, uh, they farm uh, blueberries, uh, you know, like so many things that are familiar to Mainers. Well, you know, it's not a coincidence that the tribes also do those things and probably did them before us um, and may even have, uh, you know, some good thoughts about how we could do it better uh, with an eye towards the future. So my, my suspicion is, um, as Mollian said, you know, kind of rising tide lifts all boats. Like there's a lot more opportunity there for, for everyone than there is um, anything to be fearful of. Thank you so much. I, I can't tell you how many of the questions that, that are coming in through the chat really center around that. Like, I just don't get it. This is so clearly the right thing to do. How could how could anyone, whether that is a, a next door neighbor or a governor, object to doing the right thing? Um, so thank you, Congressman, for for both um, outlining and uh, poking poking some very necessary and appropriate holes in the the, the arguments that we tend to hear. Um, you you mentioned the economic benefits and the the rising tides lifting all boats and I just want to take a second for if there's anyone on the call who hasn't had a chance to to dig into that Harvard study that Ambassador Bryant talked about um, we were lucky enough to have Dr Joseph Kalt do a, a lunch and learn program uh, a few weeks back digging into that study and it is 
really, really interesting and important. And, and there you'll find that recording in our our archives on, on YouTube as well. So really want to encourage folks to, to take a look at that. Um, Ambassador Bryant, you talked about this window that we now have, knowing that that LD 2007 is is not is won't be taken up until at least January. Uh, we've got a good list of things to to work on through the end of this legislative session. But what can we do? And there's the 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 we like what are you doing? But also what are what can we do to build momentum for self determination between now and the beginning of the next legislative session? Uh, I, I really appreciate Congressman Golden's prediction. You know, this is this is going to happen, but what can we do to make it happen sooner? Yeah, awesome. So I would suggest uh, becoming involved with Wabanaki Alliance. Uh, go to WabanakiAlliance.com. If you're a part of a group, you can sign up to be um, part of our coalition, or if you're an individual, um, you can join. And so we have weekly calls where we focus on um, in district meetings and communications and in sort of this like plethora of, of different avenues where, you know, we're taking the, the skills and talents of those involved in our coalition and, and forming these committees so that they can really hone in on, on what they would like to bring to the cause. And I think it's a model that has just worked extremely well for us. We're, we're so thankful for this broad coalition, giving so much of their time and energy um, to this very, uh, we feel, important equal rights movement. And uh, beyond that, I think it, we're in a neat time because I don't think any legislator, uh, you know, we're not writing them off. We are looking at both parties. We are looking to educate and inform and advocate no matter who the lawmaker is. So you might have you know, somebody in your district that historically hasn't paid that much attention to tribes or has been against us on some things, there might be a window here to, to reconvince them on some things, at least reopen the discussion, because we do have Republican leadership that is being open-minded to this. And we also don't want to ever take for granted our friends, um, you know, under the, the brilliant leadership of Speaker Rachel Talbot Ross uh, in the Democratic caucus, you know, feel free to, to check in with them and, and make sure that if they continue to, to be supportive, uh, let them know how much we appreciate it. Uh, I don't think you can do too many letters to the editor or, or you know, opinion pieces. And, uh, and I just think that speaking in very plain terms about why you feel this is the right thing to do in all the corners of Maine really does and, and will continue to make a big difference. Thank you. And just so everyone knows, when you, you get the follow-up email um, later this afternoon, you'll get the link to the recording of this video, which you are, are invited to share far and wide. Uh, but you'll also have a link to the Wabanaki Alliance, to some of the other lunch and learns that we, we've done on this so that you can continue your own learning and also uh, point friends and, and neighbors and lawmakers in, in the right direction as well. Um, we've talked a little bit about federal laws that are how how federal laws may or may not be applicable for the Wabanaki nations. And, you know, given that we are um, Maine conservation voters, we're very engaged in the climate action space, the very top of the, the list of, of federal initiatives that, that I'm thinking about is the Inflation Reduction Act and all of the climate action opportunities that are, are available through that. Do you all know which of those federal funding opportunities are accessible to um, to the Wabanaki nations as of now? You don't have to give me a list, just do you know? <laughs> so uh, my best stab at that is, I think when people hear, you know, federal law doesn't apply in Maine, that's it. Um, there's some nuance to it. So the state can step in when it feels like its jurisdiction is being affected or preempted. There's no real reasonability test to that, and there's no time frame on that. So we could be 
operating under, you know, a, a certain law and think we're fine. And then the state can step in and say, you're not fine. Uh, we'd like to examine this. So as far as like federal funding and programs, if we already uh, enjoy that benefit or, um, you know, take our, our contracts that run our, our tribal government departments, those are based on the fiduciary responsibility from the federal government to the tribes um, that's not affected by state jurisdiction or any of that. So, you know, things like, you know, the 638 contracts are called that run like our, our health center and our tribal governments, those um, can't be touched by the state because they don't have anything to do with state jurisdiction. So there uh, are uh, monies that were set aside in that law specific, uh, specifically for tribes uh, to uh, request those funds. Um, they're like grant programs. Um, and I, I I think what you know you should understand is that it's very possible that tribes in Maine could benefit. But if for any reason the state were to uh, feel like it was somehow, you know, um, in their lane, uh, then they could go ahead and assert that it does not, in fact, um, you know, that the tribes in Maine do not qualify. And uh, what I what we've come across, I think, in the past is that some a lot of these things take a lot of work and effort to pursue federal funds and different programs that, or projects, often to do it in conjunction with other entities, it takes a lot of work and effort. You got to you know use um, you know their staff and their you know and their local governments spend hours and time um, filling out applications, planning projects. And if you go a long way down that road, just to then suddenly have the state step in and say, no, nope, uh, we're blocking this one. Uh, I think that has been um, a source of, of very clear frustration and, and really holds back uh, the ability of the tribes to, to move forward on a lot of things. But it's also a, an opportunity lost um, in another way because you've lost all those hours and resources and, and um, you know manpower as well. So I. Who knows whether or not um, that that would be an issue with the IRA stuff, Kathleen? I don't I don't know. I would hope not. That's really helpful. Just to clarify, um, I, I think there has been so much confusion around what you know with with various people saying no, everything applies. You can get access to everything, and it's like, well, that certainty and lack of certainty um, that is a really important piece uh, to understand so what you can do is you can see the case law you can see the instances where the state has stepped in and said no and there's been uh, court uh, cases around it uh, the, the easy one that I hear um, uh, I think people like Chief Francis talk about um, just because it, it is pretty straightforward is there's a federal law that allows uh, tribes across the country to hire a doctor, a physician uh, to come work on their reservation if they're licensed somewhere else in the country, but not, you know, in the, in, in the um, state uh, where their reservation happens to reside. And uh, that has been blocked by the state of Maine. So there have been uh, licensed doctors, not licensed in Maine. Uh, you know, they've been recruited, asked to come work in, in Maine. Um, and that effort has been blocked by the state. I, you want to talk about, I don't get it. Um, I don't really get that. Uh, we have a shortage of healthcare professionals in Maine, doctors and nurses. Um, I, I, would, I would rather that we not have to compete uh, over the same pool unnecessarily if there's a federal law that says, go ahead and, and you can bring in doctors from another state and, and get them right to work in the reservations. Great. Um, that should be the collaborative attitude that we have, but for some reason, probably because the licensing board uh, objected, um, the state uh, went ahead and, and um, fought that one. I had not heard that one, and that is a, a very, um, yeah, I don't get it, and good good example to have for, for folks who say, what, I don't get it. Um, Congressman Golden, I have, I have another question for you. You talked a little bit about um, the, the sense of the Senate that Congress didn't want to get ahead of the, the state of Maine in terms of making those, those changes. If you were a betting man, do you think that, you know, if, if we are successful in enacting LD 2004, does that make it more likely for, uh, for the Senate to, to get behind a federal change um, and particularly, you know, 
Have you talked with Senator Collins and Senator King about this? I, I think that passage of LD 2004, um, whether it's vetoed or not, or vetoed and overridden or not, certainly shows that there is a majority of support in the Maine legislature, which represents the people of Maine collectively. Um, and so that does disarm one of the strongest ar arguments that was put forward in the last Congress, which was Congress should not act without um, knowing uh, that this is supported by the state of Maine. Um, of course, people could still argue, well, wait, the governor didn't support it if it were vetoed um, and not overridden. But um, I, 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 it, it certainly strengthens the position um, uh, of those arguing in favor that, wait a minute, there is broad-based support for this um, in, in the state of Maine. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I'm not going to go any further than that. Um, my staff absolutely um, you know, spent time working with the staffs of Senator uh, Collins and Senator King. I know that uh, the tribes have met with Senator King um, extensively, and I, I still think that they are in, in dialogue uh, in trying to talk about some access to some of these federal beneficial laws. Um, and I don't think that they are going to stop. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think he would. I think it's good to be at the table and talking. And, and again, no doubt that seeing um, passage of, of LD 2004 probably encourages those talks to, to continue. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, Senator Collins ha has kept an open mind today, uh, has not uh, really uh, voiced an opinion uh, in support or opposition to uh, my bill in the last Congress. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's plenty of reason to, to still have good hope that something could could be done. Uh, in this Congress or in the near term future. And plenty of reason for us to keep working really hard together at the state level to, to send the right signals uh, to, to Congress. I am so grateful. We are all so grateful to both of you for your for your work, for your time today. Um, we are coming up on time and just want to invite you to, to share any final thoughts before we we close out. I'm going to give Molly in the last word other than to say thank you for the invite and thank you for joining. Yeah, ditto. Uh, thanks for having us here. And, and I wish the speaker could join us, but I know she's off doing great things. And uh, and I want to thank um, Congressman Golden for uh, all your support. Like I mentioned, we're, we're not a big or powerful people. And, and it really means a lot that, that you fought so hard uh, and advocated on our behalf. And, and we're really... Um, grateful to have someone in our delegation that dedicated uh, to our issues. So, so thank you. And, and thank all of you who keep showing up to our coalition and, and keep wanting to learn more. And, and I do feel like we're really chipping away at something very big. Thank you, Ambassador Bryant. Thank you, Congressman Golden. Thanks to all of you for being here today and for, for being Present in this work, I, I love that image that we are we are chipping away at something really big and really important, um, and we're doing it together. So thank you. You will get a follow up email later this afternoon. Again, send it to anybody who should see it. Uh, check out the WabanakiAlliance.com and do anything and everything that that you are asked to do when you're there. <laughs> And um, we will be back in this space next week for a conversation about community development financial institutions and how they can, can play a role in building a more resilient climate future. That will be our last Lunch and Learn of June. And uh, for all of you planners out there, a little heads up, we're going to Lunch and Learn on Wednesdays in July and see how that works for us. So mark your calendars and um, we will see you back here soon. Again, just huge gratitude and um, congratulations and all the best. Ambassador Bryant, Congressman Golden, thanks to all of you. We'll see you soon.